welcome to OSU Science Cafe. Um, um, my name is Hui Fen Cheng. I'm an uh, academic liaison librarian here at OSU Library. I'm one of the coordinators for Science Cafe. And my, the other coordinator is uh, Whitney Vitali, who is standing right over there. Um, we'd like to, on, be, on behalf of Science Cafe, we'd like to welcome you to OSU uh, Science Cafe tonight. Um, so before we get our program going, um, I'd just like to take, talk a little bit about Science Cafe. Uh, for those of you who know Science Cafe very well, um, and for those of you who are first time uh, here at OS, uh, for the OSU Science Cafe, uh, Science Cafe is a monthly event that highlights interesting, relevant, current science research. Uh, the events are an opportunity to, for everybody to particip participate in lively, engaging conversations about science. Um, it's open to the public, and I like. And I w again, I once again, I welcome you tonight. Uh, before, we, I would like to uh, thank our Science Cafe sponsors, um, the Office of Vice President for Research, and OSU Library, and OSU Chapter of uh, Sigma Psi, and the President of Sigma Psi, Dr. Zasiva, is here tonight. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to thank our program partners, um, OSU, Health Promotional, uh, OSU Health Promotion Club, anyone representing the group here tonight? <laughs> um, graduate students in nutri nutritional sciences, very good, mm -hmm. yeah. Graduate students in human sciences, yes. <laughs> and food science club, very cool, very good. Um, so before we, um, before I introduce our speaker, um, we'll have some trivia question for the audience. Um, so we prepared four questions for you, and one of the, our first question is, um, according to CDC, how many American adults eat the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables? Very good. It's <laughs> who, who said A? Uh, we have a little something for you. <laughs> it's right behind you. <laughs> you. You get a pumpkin tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's correct. One out of ten. So just one out of ten adults meet the federal fruit uh, or vegetable recommendations according to a new study published today in CDC 2015 Mobility. Uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report. Question number two, the USDA recommends that men aged 19 to 30 consume how many cups of vegetable daily? Any? A? C? <laughs> the correct answer is B, two cups. Uh, it's according to uh, the CDC the uh, USDA choosemyplace.gov. And for those who are interested, uh, you can visit the website to find out more about what counts as one cup of vegetable. <laughs> Question number three, eating a diet with lots of vegetables and fruits, it's, a, it's good for you, true or false? It should be very easy. <laughs> I think we have someone over there, yes. True, absolutely. So according to 2015-2020, dietary guidelines for Americans recommend that Americans consume more fruits and vegetables as part of the overall dietary pattern to reduce the risk of diet-related chronic diseases. Last question before, we, before the program. What color vegetables should you eat the most? That's right, a variety of colors. Again, according to USDA choosemyplate.gov, any fruit, 100% fruit juice can count as part of the fruit group. Fruits may be fresh, canned, frozen, or dry, and may be whole, cut up, or pureed. So I'd like to introduce um, our program, our tonight's program. Um, it's the science of colorful foods and whole body health. Uh, our guest speaker today is Dr. Dimbo Daniel Lane. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Dr. Daniel Ling is an assistant professor in the Department of Nutritional Sciences. Uh, Dr. Ling received his MS and PhD in biochemistry in China. He came to the United States as a postdoctoral research scientist. He was a research faculty at Kansas State University before joining the OSU Nutritional Sciences uh, program. Dr. Ling has published more than 40 papers in the area of food function in human health. His current major research focuses on the role, on the role of carotenoid uh, metabolism in the gut microbiome and human immune responses. Dr. Ling has been invited to speak at various national and international conferences on carotenoids and nutritional sciences. He was a nominee for the 2018 OSU Regents Distinguished Teaching Award and College of Human Sciences Outstanding Graduate Faculty Mentor Award. So without further ado, allow me to present our speaker, Dr. Daniel Lane. Thank you, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Hui Fun and uh, Whitney. Where, where, where Whitney? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I think that's a great, great chance for me to share what I know, what I learned from my peers, from my students, and even, even you see, from my kids. So you can see that it's just you know we do have you know just a, like we first introduced. Um, my wife and I immigrated to the United States in 2000. We came here, and then we have the three kids. Now they are in middle school and elementary school. So one of the things they really like a lot, you know, they watch, watch movies like the Harry Potter. <laughs> right. I remember, I still remember a couple of years back, I asked my son, and he is the youngest when he was about eight. I just asked him, so in a case, just like Harry, right? So if you had that kind of superpower, what are you going to do? Tell me one or two things. You see what he answered? Wow. He, 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 he told me that. If I have you, you kind of superpower, I'm going to do one thing immediately. Rename all this food. <laughs> give them, give them this, you know, this, and we know this, right? And we know this. Okay, pull them all into a category we call vegetables. So, and then I can eat this kind of vegetable every day. I'm never kid, right? <laughs> so that's what he said. And then I asked why? Why you think it's, you know, you try to rename them vegetables, right? And then he said, the teacher told us, veg is good, <laughs> veg is good. Okay, so here's a question for us. I know we already know that, right? So veg is good. Right? And the kids also know. Kids will never say, you know, the parents or dad or mom told them that this is a teacher. Teacher told them. I think we actually, we do have that kind of responsibility to tell the students or tell other people so what we found, what's the critical for our health. So the problem, what we have about the public health, and everybody knows, okay, obesity, diabetic, cardiovascular disease and lots of other, you know, neurodegenerative disease, cancers, all this actually becoming more and more pro problems, right? So, and of course, people are saying, well, that's just because of genetics, right? I just got this gene from mom and dad, and of course, that's possible, right? And also, we do have some p possible factors, like environment, you know, factors, you can see here, like this, you know, the, the image that shows, you know, it really depends on where people grow, right? So that's the disease prevalence that should depend, right? And the third thing, sometimes we just ignore this. Actually, it's a lifestyle, and what we behave that. Lifestyle is also critical, right? For example, like this, pumpkin, you know, the, the popcorns or some other food, and we that do not exercise enough. Sometimes we just get lazy trying to choose whatever, so we just eat whatever we get, right? In many cases, not correct, right? So 
I said, what can we do? Well, how can we do, you know, do some kind of the, uh, kind of preventive effect, trying to reduce or trying to, you know, protect us from that kind of problem, right? As I search online, I think about it, you know, we're, you know, we are not going to talk a lot about this kind of the preventive strategies tonight. And we know we got to move more, exercise more, right? And also we know we need to eat less, right? Eat less, and then we, I, from time to time, I just tell my friends and tell people, I say, I mean, particularly when we went to go to a restaurant, right? Where do you get the most of the food? Which restaurant provides a lot more food than others? Do you have any example of that? I'm sorry, who said that? Yeah, yes. Buffet, Buffet right? So, and I, so, so what did you realize? So we, at least we have one buffet I think, on the east side of the town. I think that's just gross, right? So what's the name of that buffet? Do you see the name of that? Yeah. And we give I think that that is one of my favorite. When I just came here, <laughs> that was 2000. It's very, the, about two decades back, I just surround, right? So that buffet is closed. And then you show the next restaurant, and we sometimes, my family, and we just go there, but we just went there for lunch. We never did it for supper. So the reason is that because we always had a lot, a lot, a lot we can bring it back home, right? So it's a, you know, in, if you go to the Texas Roadhouse, you get a lot of food, right? So that's why we call it about a portion size. We do, American here, and in the United States, we do need to eat, eat a lot more than what we need. Portion size, and the third thing is, you know, it's about high fat, high salt, you know, really salty, really salty, right? And then so we have you kind of imbalance the diet. We do have a lot of meat, right? We do have a lot of others, but we really, just like the, you know, the question we just went through a moment ago, right? Actually, we really do not eat a lot of the fruits and the vegetables, just like what I, my son did, right? Okay, so that's all associated with, you know, the kind of the problems, right? We eat the food with really low fiber, with really, really low, you know, the, we call the colorful pigments, and we are going to talk about today. So here's what I'm going to focus on tonight. We actually, we really do not have that a lot, right? So all this, just like you said, is that only one of 10 get enough of fruits and vegetables. And the main of fruits and vegetables, actually they, you know, for example, I would not say potatoes, you know, potatoes are not good, right? But compared to us, definitely we do have a lot of more other choices except potato, right? We, I'm pretty sure everybody has potato, right? I would not say every day, but at least every week for many, many times, right? So what's the common things about the food I listed here? Very pretty, right? Very pretty. So, you know, you can tell we do have the red color from the, some of the seafood, and then we have the blue, and we have the orange, and even from the egg. So the key message here from this picture is uh, try to get uh, something enriched in color and also in balance. In balance. So, so, so the, about the functions, and so then, then the people ask uh, why we do need all this one. So first, just because we do not take it enough. And the third, what do we found? In many of the individuals with chronic disease, for them obesity, diabetic, or even the cancer, so they, they do have relatively low level of those pigments we are going to talk about today. You know, the phenolics, carotenoids, or the, you know, in their blood, their level is really low than the other health individuals. And the clinical study also, also demonstrated, you know, that low level might associate with, you know, that, the disease progression, right? So now, an, another issue, and uh, we know, we know we eat, right? We got what do we eat. 
but uh, people typically think about that is, okay, we got to get it absorbed, right? Otherwise, the, the rest of the world get into the toilet. Is that correct? So I'm pretty sure everybody has that experience, right? For them, if you had a very colorful, very colorful pepper, or if you have the whole pack of the blueberry tonight, or last night, right? And next morning, you'll see, you know, m most of them get into a toilet, right? The poor colors in blue or in red or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So, any concern about this? Then? The question is, are those really just a way to directly get into the toilet? Or we still be somehow be beneficial from those diets? Yeah? Okay, so I said yes, this is mainly from the nutrition department. I'm so glad. Right? So so here's a key. Here's a key. Don't be afraid. Take whatever you can. Try your best to give great variety of fruit. We can absorb some, right? And we also waste some, right? But not, they are not just completely waste, right? They help us in some way. Let's take a look. So before we get started, and I, I just try to emphasize here, we talk about the bioavailability. And we know, right, some of them cannot be absorbed. So do you think it's still bioavailable or not? Question for us. Huh? It's uh, less, right, less bioavailable. So that's, a, you know, based on the knowledge, it's kind of traditional knowledge of what we have, right? When we think bioavailable, that means we, we absorb it and then we, you know, we deliver that f from the small intestine to the brain, right, through central circulation. We get it delivered. So that we saw this is bioavailable. Okay, good. So, and then the second question, so what, how many of us know the leaky gut? Okay, so all these corners, I'm trying to see, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, can I, so what's, what do you, we know about a leaky gut, please? <laughs> okay. Um, I think that it's something where you have to feed it and it's still viable. Right. But so you keep out of the um, small intestine and not the small intestine. Right. Mm -hmm. Extra stuff, yeah. Yeah, gluten. Yeah, yeah. So it. Yeah, okay, thank you. I exactly, I think that's, a, that's a, all, all pictures we have about a leaky gut. So ideally, you know, what we have, and we know the gut, uh, human gut is an open system, right? So, and then so the, when we talk about a leaky gut, it's because we do have the, kind of the, the barrier, right, in between our tissue and the lumen. So that is just like a wall. Right, just because it's open system. Otherwise, if we don't have the wall, everything will get into our body. So we have that wall build up. But in some cases, in some disease conditions, that wall will, will, I'm sorry, so wall will somehow broke. They have some holes or whatever. So that's a bad stuff will get in. They are not supposed to be in, but they just get in. So in that we call that kind of, con that kind of uh, disease condition, we call the leaky gut. Actually, since leaky gut uh, assessment, we can, we can have that assessment done in many of the clinics here. So very simple. We can just take a, you know, a cup or two cups of kind of the carbohydrate. We could have mannose or whatever, uh, mannitose or some, some other carbohydrate, and we drink it. And then a few minutes later, test your blood concentration. 
uh, the mental in your blood. And if it's really elevated, that means that individual has a lot of severe uh, leaky gut problem compared to the others. So typically, we are not supposed, so that type of carbohydrate are not supposed to be metabolized. The only thing, we are not going to absorb it. So if the gut is leak, and then they will get in, otherwise we're not. So another third question I think about the microbiome. About my microbiome, so how many of you know about microbiome? So I'm trying again, so about this table, you want to give a try? I'm sorry, again, so this table. Okay, in the bacteria living in the gut. Yeah, yeah, it's great, thank you, thank you. Actually, so it's not only bacteria. As far as we know, you know, bacteria is the most predominant uh, population. We do have some other microbe, like a virus and some fungus or whatever, a lot of others. And believe it or not, you know, our body has like the, how many millions of the cells? But the microbiome in our gut has this more than tenfold cell numbers than us. And now you can image how complex that microbiome will be, right? And we always overlook about the function of the microbiomes. So before we born, right? Before we born, then we stay the mom, and so that actually that environment is qu quite pure, and we typically brief, you know, we do not have a lot of chance to get in, get, as, uh, get us as opposed to what we call the bacteria or the microbe, right? When we born, you know, a couple months, like a couple years old, and we got a lot of chance to play dirt and have. So that's good, that's good, that's good, that's because that will help us to build our microbiome system, right? So just because it's so complex, but that is, uh, your building process actually is, is quite a rapid. Once we're born, we believe that day, day one, day one, you know, once the, we get a discharge from the hospital, that day one, we start in the first of few months, we'll get almost uh, everything ready. And then it, in the first uh, couple of years, like two year old or up to four year old, we're almost done, you know. So that was, we call the infant health care, so important, so important. So, so just help the kids play around, it's not that bad. So there's some, uh, some concerns about that, particularly you know, when we're in the United States. So relatively, how many of you, but I'm originally from China, we know. We know the environment, we got it. Like, just like my mom and dad said, that when we were very little, we played with dust every day. Every day, but here it seems like oh, we have all oh, this so beautiful, you know, lawns, right, backyard. So, so, but it's still very critical here. In a case if we if we do not have that kind of chance, or we, for some reason, we mess up the system in our gut. In that case, we have we do have a scientific name we call it dysbiosis. Dysbiosis. So the here is a huge population of the bacteria or the, the microbe in the body, right? So they have a kind of the, we call a homostasis or kind of balance. If you have 10 million, like you, you know, actually the cell number is about 10 trillion, 10 trillion cells in the body. So we can briefly get them separated into two big groups. One, we call the, you know, bad guys. Actually, they, we call it pathogenic, pathogenic. And the other group is a commensal, it's a good guys. So they keep fighting, right? They keep fighting. We as a human, a host, as a kind of partner, actually the, we three actually have some kind of communication. We just have them balanced, okay? Everybody's safe, no concern. But in some condition, we're going to talk about here. So for example, if you have so many burgers a day, and that will cause a problem. So. That's the bad guy, or we call the pathogenic bacteria, or microbe, will grow a lot faster than the others. So, and then, so probably we, we will lose. The loss of the, you know, the battle will cause, the, we call it, you know, the disbiosis. 
So there's lots of concerns about that. And we know so many publications already show now in 2018, you know, show like all this type of disease so somehow associate or some of the disease that directly caused by this kind of imbalance like gut microbiome, right? Like obesity, diabetic, neurological disorder, GI tract disease, or some other liver disease, or you know, cardiovascular disease, right? And we know that. So that's a, that's a problem with that, right? Uh, even in cancer, so you have this. So now let's just have one, two examples, how this works. These two are favorite food my son won't have, right? Let's look at that. So we have the burgers. So what's going to happen here? Doesn't no matter how many, how frequent you take, you know, you eat a burger or the some kind of you know high energy food, right? So the first immediately you will get your gut burned, or we could inflamed, inflammation, right? Inflamed, just because overload of the nutrient, over overload the energies, you get the burned, and in the long run you see like this. Of course, this is just a kind of cartoon. Just want to show they do have a kind of significant health concern about that. Beyond that, so here's the diagram, and this is really busy. What I want to tell you here is, you know, if you have the burger, so immediate response, you get your gut just inflamed, right? So that's what we typically do about that. So this is a human clinical trial study. So they look at the gut, so look at you know, the circulation, and they look at some particular biomolecular markers, and they also look at the gut microbiome changes, all this stuff, right? So this is one of the slides from my research. So what we typically do, actually, is the community. Community is about the gut microbiome community. What we typically do right now is we get all the things, and then we put all this data together, and then we are going to run a kind of association analysis. All this is about statistics. To see, for example, this group of bacterial overgrowth, right? And then we look at if the individual has any kind of problem with, the, okay, increased inflammation marker in the blood, or increase, you know, the blood glucose, or increase, you know, whatever, you know, a kind of the uh, oxidative stress marker, whatever. And then we run association, right? And of course, we also find something decrease, right? And see what, what's the kind of potential link in between gut microbiome the diet, gut microbiome, and, and the host health, right? And then, so this is another example, this is working in my lab, is we just look at, you know, we're here, because the carotenoid is a big group of the pigments, actually from the colorful food. You can find the carotenoid from almost all kinds of the food, like particularly with the pretty color, from orange, right? Orange, dark red, dark green, even the red, right? contains all this kind of carotenoid. So what we look at here is, you know, very specifically, right? The previous slide, we talk about broadly how the food can cause changes in the gut microbiome. And then we look at the changes in the blood, right? And then if we look at specifically, so we got to focus on, so this we, you know, this just shows a kind of epithelial cell is somehow we consider as a kind of barrier, right? barrier in the gut, the gut barrier, and then we look into the old immune response underneath the, the uh, epithelial barrier, right? And we look at the how the carotenoids can regulate B cell, B cell is a type of immune cell, and also how, you know, they can cause the changes in all the commensal bacteria and uh, pathogenic bacteria as well. So we have somehow, so here we have the lipopolysaccharide, so this is actually the out wall of the gram-negative bacteria. So that LPS, a lipopolysaccharide, will cause inflammation and will also cause a leaky gut as well. So we're just looking at, you know, very broadly how the population change, and also we look at very specific biomarkers that change, you know, focus on like immune cell or the gene expression and so forth and so on. So and and also, 
you know, we do have a kind of approach, trying to confirm if we think that changes of the gut microbiome is critical for the disease progression, right? In that case, we have to confirm it. So how to do that? We just get the infants or whatever patients poop, right? The stools, we give them to the animal. That animal is supposed to be, you know, bacteria-free. We call it germ-free mice. Give that to the mice to see if the mice has a kind of the similar phenotype or similar disease phenotype, right? If yes, and then we say, oh yeah, the change of the gut microbiome for that individual will cause that kind of the problem, right? Anybody dis disagree with this? On the, yeah, great. On the other hand, now we do have a kind of clinical trial. Actually, some study has been completed very successful, particularly for treatment of some of that disease, mainly associated with the gut, the chronic, the GI chronic disease. So they do the kind of the fecal transplant or stool transplant to human as well. So that mainly focus on the GI tract problem or some other autoimmunity problem. So ha that has been very, successf very successful in the clinical trials. So actually, that's why I put it in the here, we call it stool as a medicine. So, so that's about the gut microbiome, like how the diet can cause a change in all the bacteria, trillions of bacteria, and then that trillions of bacteria will do something good or do something bad to our health, right? Okay. So now let's have a question. So how do they communicate with each other? We know, we know the gut, just in the gut, right? As all the bacteria in the gut. So how do they communicate with, for example, with the brain, with the liver, or even with the muscle or skin? How do they communicate with that? So, so that's another very, very popular field right now, they talk about, you know, the communication in between gut and the liver, gut and brain, right? Gut and retina, gut and lung. So, so many publications came out every year, every year. So, mainly, so, and in general, you know, we believe that changes, that changes that will lead in, into, we, we call, you know, changes in the immune cell in the blood, or some hormones, or even some cytokines, right? Or some other small molecules, like LPS, for example, right? It's other molecules, so a lot of other things. They can just, you know, all these molecules or whatever signals get into central circulation, and they can be transferred to brain to some other peripheral tissue as well. So that, that's a way how they communicate. And that's a way, you know, that they can state us what we are right now. So we talk about the gut changes. So, so it, the study is quite interesting. And we show, I think in the previous slide, we showed how that kind of pigment diet, uh, the colorful diet or colorful food, because changes in gut microbiome in the mice, right? So we have not touched on this one. We have not touched on this. So what about other things, right? or those already be absorbed. So I'm going to just focus a little, you know, spend a little bit more time on that, right? Now we move on to the next section. We talk about the food, right? Or food, they can by active components, which we absorbed it. Here's the story, actually that's, you know, that, actually that's my, it's my, uh, this, this picture is from my lab as I, I did some wolfberry studies uh, long, uh, about, about five or six years back when I was in Kansas. And uh, we know wolfberry, so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of the, just like a reason. It's kind of dried grapes. It's in red color, pretty red, and they contain relatively high amount of one type of carotenoid we call zeaxanthin. zeaxanthin. I got that project funded. We look at how wolfberry can cause changes in the neural disease. I got that funded by NIH. I, I still remember we have one uh, uh, kind of the kind of 
progress report meetings, and uh, you know, they asked me about that. First question is, what do you think about the most predominant by active components from your Wolfberry? Right? And at that time, I think, yeah, I think the carotenoid is one, and the second one might be the carbohydrate, the fibers, fibers. And so, and then, so the, you know, the, the committee just asked me how, how you can build up that kind of connection just because all the fibers you talk about in the wolfberry and the carotenoid from the wolfberry, actually they are not well, well absorbed. I just, that meeting was, I think that happened in 2008, about 10 years back. 10 years, at that time, they decided how much money they're going to give it to me. So I just said, well, I don't know. I don't know because we either we cannot absorb it, and so what's going to happen? At that point, I really got no idea how microbiome looks like. So, so but now, of course, it's a lot easier huh, to answer that question. So, so let's, let's look at the, so about the, the pigment. So we had a kind of conversation about signaling, and now let's look at that. So this is another example about the lutein. Lutein is the one of the <coughs> carotenoids as well. So lutein is the is very similar, very structurally very similar, the function also very close. So lutein, and we know, you know, has a very strong kind of activity to filter out the blue light. And we know the blue light, some of the UV light as well, right? So the field of the blue light as will cause the most, most harmful damage to our body, in particular in the eyeballs, right? So I do have, have eyeball here today. I'm going to look at this one to see, and we know this our all structure of the eyes, right? So here's a quick question, and if based on this one here, you see that we do see the ye yellow dot, yellow air field. So what's that? Or where does the yellow color come from? If you look at here, the module, so, so this is uh, its eyeball. I bring it here, so we know this, right? We know this, if I open that, so we, we do have the very big, we call the vitreous, right? And then we do have the lenses, so this is really highly transparent, right? So this is lenses. And then this, this part we could have reached. And then retina actually is on the far back of the eyeballs. See, see if you have the chance to look at this one. So you see the retina is somewhere here. It's a very thin. It's a very thin. But if you look in here in the, in the, in the, central, in the central retina, we we'll see actually a very small area here. So actually here, so we call it a macula. Macula. How many of you know about a macula? If not, I think the next one. Macula degeneration. It's very, very common when we get old, right? So it has that kind of a problem. So now a quick question. So what kind of pigment? Uh, why we have the yellow color here? In the macular field, in the macular area, what's from? Any common from carotenoid? Yes, of, of course. We're talking about carotenoid. Can you specify it? Lutein the dancing. We just talked about uh, lutein the dancing. Yeah, as it do function as a kind of blue light filter. Not anything else. So why we need that? Because you know here we every day when we open the eye we receive the light, right? Actually, the mercury is a place in charge of the central vision. Ninety percent of the vision is just from the mercury. So that's the mercury should receive so much of the light exposure, and then that will that will cause a problem. That causes light damage, right? I'm sure everybody, or most, of, many of us knows in summer when you do outdoor activities, right, you wear sunglasses. 
It's kind of protecting, right? Trying to protect our eyeballs, eyesight, right? So there's something similar. There's something similar here. So that pigment, that pigment that just helps us to fight against the blue light damage, right? So we could, you know, the, and now you can understand. It, the function of that is the blue light filter, and we can see also oxidative stress, uh, antioxidant. The macula. So there are actually there are three types of the pigment, not only two, right? We have lutein, we have zeaxanthin, and the third one we could have mesozeaxanthin. The mesozeaxanthin is just specific for the eyeball. We cannot get it from food. No food contains mesozeaxanthin. So how that happens? Because we, you know, we get lutein zeaxanthin from the diet. And once the lutein is just delivered into the eyeball here, right? And then we do have the enzymes, RPE65, to convert that to mesozeaxanthin from the lutein. And these three, you know, actually the relative ratio about one to one to one, so equal amount. So they are equally important for us. And, and here's a, you know, just a kind of big summarize about the possible function of all these uh, pigments in the eye health, right? So it is about the photooxidative damage, right? It's, uh, it's about, uh, you know, the, the antioxidant or the free radical damage, right? So that lutein zeaxanthin and mesozeaxanthin will play the rules, trying to you know, limits the kind of damage, trying to quench, quench all the free radicals, right? And now we know, you know, that lutein and zeaxanthin will be associated with reduced risk of the macular degeneration and cataract and some other. Here, and when we talk about eye disease, you know, the lutein and zeaxanthin and uh, methyl zeaxanthin are essential for the eye health. If some of you are interested in, you know, that's, a, you know, we just actually, we just involved in the uh, publishing a book so that's uh, edited by the, the pretty at uh, the United Kingdom about how diet can cause the changes of the eye health, right? And what kind of protective effect of all the different diets, right, in eye health. So here is the image, so we take a look at that. So this field, we call the macro, and then we do have the damaged macro here. So the central vision, the central vision will somehow lost when, when it's getting very severe. So we are the first you see blurry in the central vision, and then eventually, eventually, if we are not lucky enough, you know, we will lose all the sign. So the factors, the risk factors for the macro degeneration so first, of course, unfortunately, it's about aging, right? When we're getting old, we have a higher risk. And then all this, you know, the tobacco, gender is another thing. We cannot do anything. But to make tobaccos and all some others, you know, particularly here, like a nutritional status, we can definitely, we can do a lot trying to help us to delay the progress of the disease or even prevent it. So that's uh, pretty much what I have to share tonight. And here's a takeaway. So colorful foods are essential. Do not worry about absorption, right? The fraction we absorb is great. That will help us to get against oxidative stress, against the damage you know, caused by the light or some other components. And the third good, very good. And so we can consider uh, that as a kind of bonus, right? Non-absorbed fraction, non-absorbed uh, component, right? Even though they get into a large intestine, get into a toilet, but they still provide us very beneficial roles, right? That to improve the gut microbiome, and then gut microbiome will help us to maintain the overall health of humans. So the third is trying to increase the variety of the food. I think we already talked about that at the beginning of that. 
and the very last, to be positive and be less stressed. The reason is the stress. Stress is another issue we people typically, you know, ignore it. Right? I do have a lot of experience, experience on that. I'm not sure about yours. I'm teaching the micronutrients like vitamins and all the pigments and you know, minerals. So, for example, if I have the proposal due tomorrow and then tonight I really think I'm not ready yet, I have 10%, right? How can I get the remaining 90% done, right, tonight? And then I was so stressed, I can tell my, you know, I just feel stressed and then I tell, you know, the, the mouth getting or whatever, the eye, the vision, all this. And sometimes if you have not only tonight, if you have uh, next week, and then you have one week to worry about that, and then you see, you know, you have a sign we call the low vitamin, a kind of signature of that, so the vitamin deficiency. So the stress causes lots of problems with your observation of the nutrients, right? And also stress will cause a lot of problems with the changes of the microbiome as well. So be positive, be positive. We are busy, uh, you will have the solution of that, right? So at the very last, I want to thank, thank my lab, thank my department, or thank all the collaborators. I think without them, I cannot complete anything on that. I will not have that presentation tonight. And of course, I very appreciate your coming today, so thank you for the coming, and if you have any questions, and if you have any comments, I'm pretty sure that you know, we have time to discuss, and if I don't know, I will get back to you when I find the answer, all right? Thank you very much. <laughs>